Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Hello. Hello, Scala by the Bay. You having a good conference? Um, come on. <laughs> That's more like it. Right. Um, so I don't know if any of you saw the, the presentation I gave at, uh, at Scala Days earlier this year. Do you have a show of hands, anyone who saw it? So not many people. OK. Um, if you had seen it, you're going to be like, grossly disappointed by this one. Um, it, it's not, not nearly half as good. Uh, <laughs> so setting that expectation, um, I'm going to be talking today about Rapture, which is uh, a collection of open source libraries which I've been developing for the last few years. Now, when I, when I give these presentations, I'm always looking for advice and, and, and help on, on, on ways I can improve them, make them better. So I went to my, um, my good friend, Paul Phillips, uh, and he said, <laughs> no, he did. Paul certainly did not say that. <laughs> Paul did not say that. Uh, that that's not uh, in his vocabulary. He said, yeah, really if I thought this situation would make much more sense if only John Pretty were talking over it. Um, Thanks, thanks, Paul. So without further ado, OK, enough of this. Yeah, you, you, didn't, you didn't get to that. It was, that was meant to be Miles who was just like peeping in over the corner there. The, uh, the, the screen dimensions changed. Anyway, I'm, I'm going to do this really fast. We're going to go through, hopefully, uh, 50 one-liners uh, in, in, in Rapture. In, uh, I've got about half an hour left, I guess. Um, so Rapture is, um, first of all, an I.O. library. Um, when you're working with I.O., you want to talk about resources and like places where you, you have data. So one, one such place might be um, a URL. So this is an example of how you write a URL in, in Rapture IO. So there, there is the domain name, there is the, the, the path. And if you were to type this into the REPL, that's what you'd get. You could do the same thing with a, with a file, so if it's on your local file system. That's kind of what it would look like. But this is, uh, this is the old way of doing it. In, uh, in the latest version of Rapture, we've got a, a, a URI macro, which is a string context. So if you've seen string context before, like the uh, like, uh, um, string interpolation, you normally have an S there. This is, this is kind of the same, the same, same feature of Scala 2.10. But this actually invokes a macro. Now we'll notice, this is, I mean, it looks like a string, but it somehow worked out that it is an HTTP URL rather than some other kind of URL. Um, so this is, this is typed as, as an HTTP URL, which, OK, that's not so impressive until you see an alternative where the only real difference is that it starts with the word file there. So Rapture.io gives you a really neat way of defining resources. Uh, it uses white box macros to, to work out the exact type so you get all the appropriate functionality for that thing without, without having to learn the old, uh, slightly, slightly convoluted syntax you saw at the beginning. So one thing we might want to do is uh, load an HTTP URL from just a plain old string, because we don't, we don't know at compile time what that string will be. So if that's what you wanted to do, you would simply go with HTTP.parse and then, then a string. And that, that will hopefully return a, a valid HTTP URL. I'll show you later on what happens if it turns out not to be valid. But for now, let's assume we'll get an HTTP URL out of it. 
I'm going to turn the, uh, the volume down. There we are. So, one, one feature of Raptor I.O. is that it, it separates capabilities. Now, a capability might be, for example, as we've got here, slurping the entirety of a resource into memory. It separates that capability from the definition of the, the resource. So this is the resource. Nowhere on the resource is it defined what it means to slurp. That's not, that's not part of the interface. The interface is pretty empty in that case. Slurp is, is, uh, is added on uh, using, using an implicit conversion. And if we, if we call dot slurp on this thing, then we get some bytes. So those are some bytes. By default, it will display them as, um, as hex. Uh, why isn't this an array of bytes? Can anyone think of any disadvantages with just returning an array of bytes? Whoever said it's mutable is correct. I didn't hear you. <laughs> um, so this is, this is like an immutable wrapper around, around bytes, uh, in, in the same way that we have a, a string for character data. Now, this is, this is, uh, this is a JSON file, we can, we can assume. So we probably don't want those bytes, we want a, a string. So in order to do that, all we have to do is change the type here. Or not, maybe. Okay, we've got an error. So we've tried to slurp characters from this, this exact same URI. Now the error message here, what does it say? Error, cannot find implicit reader for uh, file URL resources. File URL resources can only be read if a reader implicit exists within scope. Well, that's, I, I, okay, I don't really know what that means. Uh, note, if you're working with ca uh, character data, you will require an implicit character encoding, e.g. import encodings.system or encodings.utf8. Okay, well, that's more useful. Now, this is, this is the typical approach I've tried to take with Rapture. It makes use of implicits very heavily. Now, implicits are great, but they're meant to kind of be hidden. They're meant to, they're, they're meant to be... Uh, um, I was going to say seen and not heard, but they're neither seen nor heard. Um, so as much as possible, I provide additional information about what you need to do if there is an implicit missing within scope. So here it says import and encoding. So let's do that. This is all we, all, all we have to do. Now, one thing to note here is that I've, I've written this as UTF-8 uh, in backticks. Now, a lot of... A lot of libraries, certainly in Java, uh, will, will apply some kind of arbitrary transformation to identifiers that, that, that can't, well, identifiers that include a character that can't be represented in, in, a, in a Java identifier, such as the, the hyphen there. Uh, now, it's a pain as a programmer to have to remember what particular encoding's been used to do that. So in Raptor, I've said, okay, well, we'll just use whatever the canonical representation is and if there, are, if there are characters we can't represent, we'll stick it in backticks. And it's a simple rule, and uh, it, it applies everywhere that, that there is that issue. So having done that, we can then, we can then slurp this in again as, uh, as, as character data, and we've got some, we've got some JSON here. Now this, this particular file, I think it, it is actually still on the server there if you want to have a look, but it uh, starts off with, it, it, it's basically, um, uh, a very brief description of the, uh, the, the 2012 election. Um, this is a string, so it works out that given, given characters as our, as our, as our type for, for data to be slurped, a string is the result. In the same way that bytes result, well, a, a, a byte type there resulted in the type bytes coming out here. Now, Rapture is also a JSON library. So given that string, we can parse it. Just do json.parse and, and, and the string, and we get something of type JSON. Now, with, for example, the standard library JSON parser, you end up with, with an any type. I mean, it could be a, could be a map, could be a list, um, because JSON is dynamic. We don't generally know at compile time what, what, what types it contains. And that, that's, that's like a fundamental property of JSON. Uh, we, 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 just, uh, we, we, we just don't know unless we've applied some schema. And, and right here, we haven't, we haven't given it any reason to, to believe it's, 
it's a map or an array or, or, or a scalar value. But it's, it's able to print out, um, print out what, what, the, what the JSON is, and it's, it's, it's parsed correctly. We haven't had an exception thrown, so that's good. Now, in, in, in the previous one, this is, this is, uh, this is the, uh, the, the slightly older version of, of Raptor JSON. You, you have to get, get the string first and then, then parse it. Uh, in the latest version, which isn't quite released yet, should be, should be out in the next couple of weeks, we can just put the URI there. And as long as that URI is readable, so there, there is the capability available as a type class for reading that, that kind of URI. Now remember, this, this is an HTTP URL, it's not a file URL. There might be different rules for what, what is readable and what isn't, but this HTTP URI is readable. We can just put it in as the parameter to the JSON parse method, and it will parse it directly. So that's, that's two lines in, in, uh, in, 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 in Rapture uh, 090 and, uh, and, and down to one in 010. So what can we do with this JSON? Well, if you, let me show you the previous one. We have, we have a map and there is this, uh, this candidates element, which is an array. Now, I can just call dot candidates on that. Now this, this might seem a bit magic because I, I've already said that we don't know anything about the schema for the JSON. But nevertheless, I'm calling dot candidates. Now, this is using Scala's dynamic trait. So at this point, I could call dot anything. And what it would do is it would, it would assume that there is that type there, that there is the, 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 the value candidates, and it will effectively dereference it. And when it, when it calls to string, for example, in the REPL here, calls to string, we get, the, uh, we, we get a string representation of the candidates. Likewise, if we wanted the first one, we just apply zero to it, and it displays a string for the, the, the zeroth or first element of that, uh, of that array in the JSON. Within that, we can call dot name. Now you might wonder, well, am I just, am I just exchanging loads of arbitrary casts as I would have written in the old fashioned, uh, in the old fashioned standard library JSON parser for slightly nicer syntax, but still all the same risks of, of, of typing? Well, actually, no. This won't ever throw an exception. I mean, two string may fail to return a useful value, and it'll, it'll say undefined if, it, if, you, uh, if you try and access something that's not there, but you won't get an exception thrown. The point at which you get an exception is once and once only at the end of accessing a particular piece of data within JSON. So when you call dot as, and dot as is pretty much the only method defined on a, on a JSON type, when you, when you actually try and get a type string in this case from that, 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 that path into the JSON, that's, when, that's the one point at which an exception might be thrown. Um, so in, in, in this case, we've managed to get the string out of, of that JSON. Likewise, we, we could have done uh, dot .age and dot .as int, and it will, it will grab an int. So that's, that, that, and that kind of works as you would expect. Now, something more complicated is, I mean, maybe we want to get like an entire candidate out in one go from, from our JSON. Maybe we want to represent that candidate using a, a case class. So the two parameters that we're interested in are the name and the age. So first of all, let's, let's define a case class to represent that. That should be quite straightforward. By the way, this is meant to be completely interactive, so if anyone has any questions, just yell out and, uh, and ask. Oh, by the way, can you also count how many slides I'm going through, because I've got no idea how, uh, how, how close to the end I am. We're on about 20 at the moment, I think. Maybe a bit fewer. Uh, so we, we, can, we can actually say dot as and a case class type here. Rapture JSON will extract well, you can extract using the as method any, any type which it knows how to extract. Now, that includes the scalars, like int, double, string, and so on. Uh, it includes any case class. So it uses a, a macro to, to associate the, 
the map values name and age in this particular case with the, with the parameters to the case class. And if they're present, then it will be successfully able to extract a candidate. So that, that, that gives you a very, very quick way of <clears throat> quick way of constructing some data and, and effectively applying a schema to your JSON. Now what what is this? Return try. Now I, I mentioned that if you if you try and access a value that's not there in the JSON, then an exception might be thrown. Who likes exceptions being thrown? <laughs> so I, th there is one hand up. Thank you for being honest. <laughs> um, exceptions aren't always the best way of dealing with failure, as you may have experienced. There are alternatives. So you maybe want to return a try. Now, what I could have done is I could have re-implemented this whole API with different variants, one for returning try, one for just like throwing exception if there's a failure. Maybe some people wanted to return options or either. So well, I've mentioned four different versions of the API. This, this is becoming quite an overhead now. But how about, how about just a general solution? So what you can do is you can import a mode. You can import return try. That, that is an example of a mode. And then, as if by magic, that exact same call, now this is literally the same, exactly the same code you saw on the, uh, two slides ago. It is now returning a try of a candidate. It won't throw an exception. The, old, the older version would, but because we've imported that modes.return try, this will magically, and when I say magically, I don't mean macros. This is, this is uh, completely independent of macros. Um, but it is magic. Um, so this is hopefully, this hopefully gives you a lot of flexibility. Um, I, I, I could talk for ages about, about modes, um, and in fact I did that at the Scala workshop in, uh, uh, in, in Sweden a couple of weeks ago. Um, there is a, a presentation online. I will, I will tweet the details later on, on, on that, but it explains how modes work and gives you a few examples of different ones. For now, I will, I will show you that one. And another one which, which kind of arose by, uh, not, not so much by design, but by serendipity. Um, I discovered that actually you could, you could return a future instead. So rather than, rather than returning a try or an option, you could just import this one thing well, you import this and you also import an execution context, but given those two things in scope, any, any fallible method, any method which might throw an exception in, in Rapture will actually now return a future. And that will be executed on the, on the thread pool. All it takes is this, uh, this import. So, for example, with that in scope, we can just take our URI, we can slurp it, this is, this is a risky operation. I mean, your, your network might go down. Anything could happen. It, it also might take a long time. You might have a really slow connection. So let's, let's instantly return a, a future of that result. It knows, it knows all the details of the, the return type. And at some point when that completes, if it completes, um, you, you, you'll, you'll get a, a, a string inside a future. Chester. Yeah, so what happened if you So you'll get ambiguous implicits. Um, yeah, so it, it needs to find a unique instance of a mode in scope. By the way, anyone tweeting me will find that actually the whole podium vibrates. Maybe I'll put that down there. Now the whole stage will vibrate. So um, yeah, that's a good, good question. Uh, you can have only one, one mode in scope at, at any one time, um, but, but they, are, they are scoped to well, the implicit scope. So you could have different parts of your code that, that use, um, use different modes. And it might be very, really appropriate to have one mode for accessing JSON and another mode for, for doing your IO operations. Question over there. Uh, how confused would I be if I accidentally organized imports? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, 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 so, does, does your organize 
imports commands, is, is, it, uh, is it aware of implicits? Well, it, yeah, it's aware of, I think it's aware of implicit, like say for IntelliJ, but is it, I would, I'm just, it's a new thing for me to think about implicit. Right, yeah, so the, the, the ordering shouldn't, the ordering of the, impl the, the import shouldn't be significant. If, if you organize impl uh, imports in IntelliJ, it won't pull ones out to the top, generally speaking. So you can do an import statement further down in the code, if you just want it in a particular function, you want to have it behave in a certain way. If you do organize endpoints, it will rip it out of that function and move it to the top, unless you've done something funky in your settings. And if it's if it's not explicitly referenced, right? If you're yeah, it does. Type in. Yeah, I mean, so so you're right. This this isn't explicitly referenced. Um, thanks, thanks. Uh, I, I'm glad someone here knows more about IntelliJ than I do. Um, yeah, question at the front. Uh, So where you explicitly specify what, what you want. That is actually an option, yeah. You can, um, if you Im import, instead of return try or return futures, you can import something called uh, explicit mode. Now that will mean that everything will uh, return what, what's called an unevaluated value. And that has methods on it like, um, uh, it, it, it's got like attempt, which will return a try. It's got future, which will return a future. It's got option, which will return an option. Um, so that, that, that is a possibility, yeah, where, where, you want to, where you want to do it on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, I'm going to say last question on modes. Um, is to have a try in the future? Yeah. So you, you, want to, you want to have a future of a try? Or a, like yeah, you, you can, it's a good question, you can also compose modes. So they are an implicit, and uh, normally, you, the, the easiest thing to do is import it, and then it's just in scope. But what you can do is define your own, your, your own uh, implicit mode. And you could say implicit mode equals, uh, or implicit val mode equals, um, and then return try, compose, return future. And that will, that will return a, a try within a future. Yeah. I should have talked about modes today, shouldn't I? Right, so another thing you can, you can extract is a list of things. So there the, the was, uh, the, the were in fact more than one candidate in the election. Um, and if, 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 we, if we do json.candidates.as list of candidate, these things are composing as well. So we can, in, in, in one line, we can extract both candidates where it, it, it is, it is effectively uh, uh, getting, getting the, the, the string and, and the int from here, likewise string and int from there, which enables it to get the candidate in, in, in both elements of the array and then construct a list of them. So lists are nice, but other, other collection types uh, also exist. Who likes using stacks? Um, probably one of the, the, the lesser well-known uh, collection types in the standard library. Um, but you can extract them. So you can, you can in fact, extract any type, uh, any, any collection type that, that is buildable, so it has a can build from available. So yeah, whatever, whatever collection type you want to use, just, just specify that and that will, that will pull out the, uh, the right type and build, build it for you. Um, I've defined something else here. I've defined an entire election. So my, my election has two parameters. There is a year. I didn't, you didn't actually see the year in the, in the JSON example there, but, but there is a, a year value. And then there is the, the, the sequence we already saw of candidates. So all we, all we need to do is specify our, our election as having two parameters, candidates and year. And we can, we can try and extract this. And it will actually work. So in, in, in one line, plus, plus some case class definitions, we can just take the whole, the whole of our JSON structure and pull out an election from it. And th that, is, that is what it looks like. So we've, we've, we've effectively used a, a schema defined by case classes and pulled the whole lot out. Elect, uh, and and this, this works for any case class provided all the parameters of the case class are themselves extractable. So applying this recursively, 
elections are extractable because, um, because essentially the candidates are and, and, and the, the, the string and the int are, are, are extractable. We can also construct some new JSON. This is, if you like, a JSON literal. It's a really simple map. It's got one, one key and one value. Oh, by the way, this, this, this says nothing about my political affiliations. It is merely an example. Don't, don't infer anything. We can, even, we can even substitute values in there. So in my, in my new vote JSON, I can, I can substitute uh, in the same way that you do with an interpolated string, just, just put a JSON value in there, and it will, will substitute it in. So any, any, any type which is extractable can be, um, can be put into a JSON string context like this. So this, this allows you to very, very concisely return a, a chunk of JSON. So we, we have, we have a, uh, an immutable data structure representing JSON. One thing we can do is, is modify it, or well, at least we can, we can create a new version based on some change. So this here is a, uh, effectively a lens. We can, we can say, well, we're, given, uh, given our existing vote object, we're gonna create a new one with the year value set to 2012. So that wasn't there before, we've just added it, and this, this, is, a, this is a definition of, uh, uh, of, of that updated JSON. Now this might look weird. Does anyone know what's going on here? So this looks a lot like the, um, the string context I showed you before, but it's inside a case. So what it's actually doing is, is, is pattern matching on JSON, on a JSON literal. So if your vote, and you, you saw the vote before, happens to be a map, with a vote key inside it, which itself has a name key, we can extract a, a value C, which we can then use over the right-hand side of the case clause. So you might want to use this if you had a really complicated JSON structure, and there were like two or three values deep within that structure, structure that you wanted to pull out and use in a, in a case match. You define only the bits you're interested in, and, and you can literally just pull them out, and, and they are available. Don't forget, when you, pull a, when you pull a value out, you don't know what type it is. So you still have to call .as and specify type. C is of type JSON. We, we, we still have this, this challenge of, of getting from the untyped, dynamic world of JSON into the Scala world, and, and, and the method as is what, what takes us across that boundary. Now, uh, you, you might have assumed, probably quite reasonably, that I, I, I just implemented my entire JSON parser and, uh, and, and an AST representation. Um, I didn't feel confident to do that. So I, I thought, okay, well, I'll just use somebody else's. And the best, by far, JSON library out there is the standard, oh, hold on, no, not the standard library. Um, well. There is, there is a JSON parser in the standard library. Who, who has used it? Who has stopped using it? <laughs> so that, I, think, I think it was the same set of hands up both times. Um, it is there, it, it, it works, but it, it's not particularly fast, and uh, I've heard tales of memory leaks and all sorts of nasty stuff. But you, you, can, you can use you can use as a back end the standard library parser. And the benefit of that is that at least in Scala 2.10 you have no external dependencies, if that is a, a primary concern above like other stuff. Alternatively, you might want to use Jackson. I'm, 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 gonna, I'm gonna mention a few of these. So um, can everyone cheer if I mention a, uh, a, a library, a JSON library that they have used? So, uh, Jackson, yay. yay, okay, a lot of people like Jackson. Jason for S, so a little bit less, but, but J Jason for S is supported. Lift Jason, yeah, good, good. Argonaut, yay, I, well, there's, there's definitely a sort of Scala Z 
crowd over here. <laughs> um, does anyone know John? You should. John is uh, Eric Osheim's uh, JSON library, and it's really fast. Um, it is possibly faster than Jackson at some things. You might not believe me, but it is. <laughs> so all, all of these are supported. They, they use type classes to basically abstract over the, over the parser and the AST. And it just means that you can, you can slot in whichever, whichever particular backend you want to use. So that, that's immutable JSON. And in the same way that we have lists and list buffers, you have JSON and JSON buffers. So what we can do is we can start out with a, a, a pretty uninteresting JSON buffer, an empty map. And we can just add a value to it. So we just say jb.life. We're going we're to, um, oh, there's a mistake there. That, that should say jb.life equals, ignore the plus there. Uh, and that will, set, will set the value of life to 42 within our, within our JSON buffer. We could, same mistake again, sorry. We can add a candidate uh, to, to our, our JSON buffer. There it is. This, this is all we have to do. So this, this is actually kind of like a, uh, uh, probably a very, very slow and inefficient, but in-memory database. We're just like modifying, mutating stuff in memory. Um, Given that, given we've made all kinds of mutations to our JSON buffer, all of which are typically one-liners, we can say write that, at least in version 0.10, we can say write that to, uh, to a file. So we're going to write that to home data candidate.json. Uh, Jason, at the back? Five minutes. Five minutes, OK. I'll, I will. How, how many slides have I done? Who? So 010 is the version of Rapture, Jason. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm probably about 42 through, so I'll, I'll, I'll do the last eight or so. Uh, th th this, this isn't the feature of the currently released version. That, that's why I've specified uh, 010 there. Previous slide. Previous slide? Are you trying to influence us? No, no, no. No, not at all. <laughs> she hasn't even declared her candidacy yet. Um, yeah, I, I, she, she happened to be, well, th there are no Republican candidates yet. <laughs> Honest. <laughs> so, uh, oh, by the way, this, this one, this works because file URLs are writable. If we were to put a, an HTTP URL here, it just wouldn't work because there's no way of, there's no way of writing to an HTTP URL. I mean, what you could do is you could, you could define a type class, an implicit within scope, that says, well, I, I've, I've got a way of writing to HTTP URLs. I, I, I've no idea what it is. But, but if someone were to, to provide that type class, then you could, you could specify that. And, and here, you could have an HTTP URL. Uh, question over there. Just Sorry? Put. Put. Um, Put is an HTTP command, which is also available in save. Save? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. You could do. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm I'm very open to suggestions on on on, on the API. Thank you. Uh, we've also got copy to, so we can copy from a file to a file. So there there is our our source file candidate.json, and well we're, we're we don't want to risk losing it, so we'll make a copy on our file system. So there, there is the new copy. And the generally, methods which return unit, as this might do, are, Save sorry? Save us. Say again? Save, Save us. Save as. Save as. So this, this one is more like a copy. <laughs> <laughs> but you mean, the, you mean the previous one, save as? This one, OK. Uh, yeah, you could do. Um, what, 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 whatever. <laughs> so <laughs> we, we, we can copy this to, from, from one place to another. And yeah, as I said, uh, unit being returned as, as, a, as a result type is pretty uninformative. 
So it would be useful actually to have a little bit more information. So you get this thing called a summary, a copy summary, which says using a file system copy, 85 bytes have been transferred. Great, okay. Now we can, we can copy from an HTTP URL as well. Now all you need to be able to copy is something that's readable and a destination that's writable. Anything that's readable can be copied to, to anywhere that's writable. So this works perfectly fine as well. But the only reason this works is because Raptor knows how to stream. So this is a streamed copy. This is not a file system copy. So the file system copy will be quick. It just runs the command on the file system and says, like, copy, copy this. And it doesn't have to load the data into memory and, and write it out again. We don't have that luxury with, with HTTP copying to, to files. So it kind of falls back on the next best thing and does a streamed copy. So you might be interested to look at the, uh, this actually statically resolves, so it does know at uh, compile time whether it's going to stream or, 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 or do a, a genuine copy. Um, so this, this works fine too. We can even do something like this. So we can copy straight up our class path. This is, this is a, a class path URI that works in, in uh, Raptor 010. And we can copy it straight to S3. I haven't actually implemented the S3 thing yet, but it's, it's pretty straightforward, as long as we've got a way to write to S3, and you could provide that as a, as a, as a type class. In one line, we can go straight from, from class path to, to a, a writable resource somewhere. And again, you get the, the streamed copy summary. I hope I've got a whole section on cryptography. I'll go through this really quickly. So you can, you can generate a key. You specify a type here as to, to what, um, what, what, what kind of crypto you want to do. Uh, we can do blowfish. So we've generated a key here. With a key, we can encrypt something. So let's encrypt a string. We then get some byte data out again. This is actually a subclass of, of bytes encrypted. Say again? I thought someone said something. Was it a heckle? <laughs> OK. <laughs> um, so yeah, we've got some encrypted data here. Maybe. Maybe displaying those bytes as hex is actually a bit, bit verbose, and we want to use base64 instead. So we can call as. This is, this is a different as method from the one you saw before, but it's kind of got the same effect. We can display that as a, a string of uh, base64 characters. And then having done that, we can decrypt it again. Notice that because that, that encrypted is, is previously typed uh, back here, as, as encrypted data of Blowfish, it knows that, well, and also the key is, is typed with, uh, with, with Blowfish. It will, it will check that the type of the key is the same as the type of the encrypted data, and it knows at compile time that it's safe to do that. So we get this decrypted uh, byte data back. Well, that doesn't say hello world, because we don't actually know that it started off as a string. It got, it got serialized somewhere along the way to bytes. So, once again, we have to say as, sorry, it's a little bit covered up there. We, we say as string. And then because there happens to be an, an encoding, remember I imported encodings.utf8, because that is in scope, it is happy to transform those, those bytes into a, uh, in, in, into a string. Um, so a, a decision I took uh, quite early on, uh, it's relating to what Jared was talking about earlier, that you end up very frequently with encoding issues uh, if you're not careful. Java uses as a, as a default the system encoding. So your, your code may run absolutely fine on your local machine. You deploy it to a server which has a different, uh, which maybe has uh, ISO 88591 instead of UTF-8, which you're using locally. And stuff breaks in subtle ways. So at all times, I, I'm, I, I insist that there is an implicit, sorry, there, <laughs> there is an explicit implicit uh, specified whenever you do anything that requires translation between bytes and characters. Uh, such as here. Now, this is kind of cool. So you know I showed you all those different backends you can use for, for JSON. I thought, wouldn't it be interesting if rather than actually use a JSON parser, I just plugged in a, an XML parser instead? Because I can use arbitrary ASTs. So, OK. Rapture XML was invented. and you, you, can, uh, you can parse some, uh, some XML like that, 
and it, it knows how to parse it. You get an XML object, which is pretty much equivalent to the JSON. The structure, I had to modify a bit because the structure of XML is, is more complicated than JSON. But we can do all the same things we did before. We can call dot candidate dynamically. We can get the first element. We can call age on that, and we can extract an int from it. And it all it all works reasonably well. There's a few there's a few corner cases which which are more complicated than they are with JSON. So there's more work to be done on that. We could also do Beeson. I haven't I haven't done it yet, but Beeson is probably an easier task than than XML because it more closely represents JSON. Okay, so this is this is a one-liner. I mean, it, it, it spreads onto several lines, but uh, the, it, it is it is um, it, it could be it could be compressed onto a single line. So what what is this doing? I mean, you, you probably wouldn't want to do this in a, in a single in a single line, but it's possible. So okay, we're using a key, the one we, the Blowfish key we had before, and we're encrypting some JSON which we're parsing from straight from this URL. Now this will give, you, give us an immutable JSON object. And we are adding a password to that, which is secret. So from, from here, sorry, from, from here up to here is a, is a new JSON object, which I've, I've created with, with some modification. I've encrypted the whole lot. And I'm then writing it, or save as, if you prefer, <laughs> to, to this, this URL here, which is a file. This is writable. So the whole thing results in a, in a write summary, which is the, the, the size of the result, well, tells us the size of the resultant, uh, resultant write. So this is my grand finale. This is like trying to combine all those different things into a, into a single one-liner. Uh, hopefully that's... Uh, that, that's interesting. Um, and I'll, I'll leave you with um, Paul Phillips' follow-up quote. In spite of it including John Pretty talking over things, this could be an improvement. <laughs> I, 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 hope it, I, hope it, uh, I hope it was an improvement. Uh, that's it. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>